All right, so as folks continue to join us, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live with Bettina Gonzalez, Heather Cleary, and Idra Novi discussing Gonzalez's English language debut, American Delirium. You can follow the link posted in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Before we get started, we do wanna thank all of you out there for joining us. We're really grateful to our community of customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Bettina Gonzalez is the best-selling author of several novels and short story collections, for which she has won several awards, including the prestigious Premio Tusquet. She earned her MFA in bilingual creative writing at the University of Texas at El Paso and her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. She lives in Buenos Aires and teaches at the University of Buenos Aires and New York University Buenos Aires. Heather Cleary translated Cesar Venduela's Sociophobia and Sergio Chase's Planets in the Dark, among other novels and poetry collections. Her translations have been finalists for the National Translation Award and the Best Translated Book Award. And she holds a PhD in Latin American and Iberian cultures from Columbia University. She lives in New York and teaches at Sarah Lawrence College. Idra Novi is the author of the novel, Those Who Knew, a finalist for the 2019 Clark Fiction Prize, a New York Times Editor's Choice, and a Best Book of the Year with over a dozen media outlets including NPR, Esquire, BBC, Kirkus Review, and O Magazine. Her first novel, Ways to Disappear, received the 2017 Sami Roar Prize, the 2016 Brooklyn Eagles Prize, and was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize for First Fiction. She teaches fiction writing at Princeton University. And as for the book, Gonzalez's English language debut, American Delirium, is a dizzying, luminous novel about an American town overrun by a mysterious hallucinogen and the collision of three unexpected characters through the mayhem. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Bettina Gonzalez, Heather Clara, and Idra Novi. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you to everyone for joining this event to celebrate the launch of American Delirium. It is such an honor to be doing this event with Politics and Prose and with Heather and Bettina to celebrate this brilliant novel, which I was lucky to read in Galley and thought it was just absolutely dazzling. Um, we thought to get things started because it's such a wonderfully unpredictable novel for Heather and Bettina to read for all of you to hear a little bit about the surprising prose and the surprising turns that this novel takes. So they're each gonna tell you a little bit about what surprised them as author and translator and then share a little of the book with you. Okay. <laughs> well, there were many, were many things that surprised me as a writer because this novel took a long time to write. Um, I worked on this book for like six or seven years. So I had time to, you know, get many surprises along the way. Uh, but there is a particular scene where there, are, there is a, this character, this old lady that used to be a hippie. Uh, when she was younger. Um, she lived in a commune and you know, she's doing this kind of videos, memoir, where she talks about her youth and things she did um, she's not too happy about. Um, and I knew she had some scene in her past. I knew she had a secret, but I wasn't sure which um, way I was going to, to go with that and to tell, to write about that secret. Uh, I remember writing this scene where he, she was um, going to the town with a younger girl, um, which is an, another important character in the book. And then something very violent and unexpected happened. And I felt that it was um, so powerful and um, it was a way of presenting 
uh, that secret in a very powerful way. So I let it out and I wrote it and you know, the next day I read it and I said, yes, this makes sense for her. Something happened. She wanted to create a bond with that other woman and she did something terrible in order to create that bond. So that's what the scene is about. I don't know. <laughs> so you, Heather, I, I know you. this scene also surprises, surprises you as a reader. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Or read sure. it? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and before I before I start in, thank you so much, Ija, for for being here with us to celebrate this book. Um, and thank you, Bettina, for writing it because I loved every minute of the translation. It was such a joy. Um, one of the things that I I found surprising um, and and kind of really uh, impressive, awe inspiring is the way that you have the threads of the novel kind of come back together and connect um, all the different ways these, these three lives are, touch one another. Um, so, and I think that this scene that, that we, we decided to read also touches on that aspect of the novel um, because the two characters in car, perhaps I'll, I'll give a little bit of an introduction so that we can place what's happening. Um, so this is this is Beryl's memory that she's recounting, but it's an episode that takes place with a young woman named Gabby from the commune, who is the grandmother of another one of the, the stories, um, Berenice, the young girl, um, who is the centerpiece of the of one of the narrative threads. So there's that connection to Berenice's life um, and to sort of the missing piece um, in her story. And it turns out that Beryl also knows and works with um, one, the other character, uh, Vic, who's, whose narrative we follow at the beginning of each chapter. So I, I found it really masterful and, and exciting to see all the ways in which these stories kind of overlap and then kind of diverge again and then, and then turn up these other connections. And um, so, so perhaps we'll just read this section and then we can kind of get into the into the details of. Do you want to start in Spanish? Yes, I just I don't know. I read um, a few paragraphs in Spanish and then you can take it from there. Recuerdo ese día el único en que bajamos juntas al pueblo. Alguien decidió que faltaba mantequilla. Se dan cuenta, la vida de una persona puede cambiar para siempre porque a otra le falta mantequilla. Ese día la cocina era un desastre, parecía que un ejército la hubiera, la hubiera saqueado. Montones de platos sucios, cáscaras de huevos y latas vacías se apilaban en un rincón. La heladera contenía algunas cubetas con hielo y un frasco con salsa picante. En las alacenas no había más que un paquete de harina, una botella de vinagre y una bolsa con manzanas que habíamos comprado a unos granjeros de la zona. Nuestra huerta había sido un fracaso. Solo habían, aprend habían prendido unas habas amargas que nos habíamos hartado de comer. El dinero y nuestros planes para conseguirlo se habían acabado hacía rato. Trabajar no era una opción. Gutiérrez estaba de viaje. Clark encerrado en el, en el sótano con unas chicas viendo viejas películas mudas. Frank y los músicos de turno ensayaban en el salón comedor. Yo tenía hambre. Por esa época siempre estaba engullendo algo. Mi hambre era existencial, descomunal, bostezadora. Desde su lugar, sobre una alfombra raída, un chico de grandes ojos ámbar dijo que había que hacer un pastel de manzanas, que solo llevaba harina y mantequilla. Gaby estaba tirada en un sillón con tres de sus admiradores, dos chicas y un tipo algo mayor que yo, pelado y de barba roja, que se decía artista. Desde que había llegado se había dedicado a rellenar con pintura goteros de distintos tamaños, con los que finalmente roció una madera grande como la pared de la sala. Lo llamaba silabeo cósmico, imagínense. La cuestión es que Gaby me miró desde ese conjunto humano, apartó brazos y piernas y dijo, vamos, Berilia, a repartir magia y a comprar mantequilla. Fantastic. Um, okay. I remember that day, the one time we went into town together. Someone decided we needed butter. You realize what that means? A person's life can change forever because another person needs butter. The kitchen was a, was a disaster that day. It looked like it had been ransacked by an army. Stacks of dirty plates, eggshells, and empty cans piling up in one corner. A few ice trays and a bottle of hot sauce in the fridge. 
There was nothing in the cabinets but a bag of flour, a bottle of vinegar, and a bag of apples we bought from some local farmers. Our vegetable garden had been a failure. The only crop that had taken were some bitter, fa bitter fava beans we'd gotten sick of eating. Our money and our plans to get more had run out a while back. Working wasn't an option. Gutierrez was traveling, Clark locked in the basement watching silent movies with some girls. Frank and the musicians on shift were practicing in the dining room. The poor thing had learned to play the kettle drum on one of the trips he'd taken with Gutierrez. I think the others either put up with it or were too drugged out to notice he had no talent. I was hungry. Back then I was always eating something. My hunger was existential, colossal, yawning. From his spot on the threadbare carpet, a young man with large amber colored eyes said he knew a recipe for apple pie that only took flour and butter. Gabby was sprawled on a sofa with three of her admirers, two girls and a guy with a bald head and a red beard who was a little older and called himself an artist. Since he arrived, he'd spend his time filling droppers of different sizes with paint, which at some point he'd sprinkle over a piece of wood the size of one of the living room walls. He called it cosmic syllabification. Imagine. The point is, Gabby looked up at me from that human mass, untangled her arms and legs, and said, come on, Brilia, let's go spread some magic and buy butter. You had to climb two hills to get to the nearest store, which was in a gas station. They didn't like us in town. It took a lot of guts to walk into Mrs. Briggs's shop and face that line of serious expressions. After the episode with the police and the underage boy, we tried not to attract too much attention. In the name of freedom and of Gutierrez and Clark's experiments, we'd always take the longer, less traveled way to the gas station, or else we'd pile into a van and go to another town where our peculiarity would get lost among the tourists. So we headed out, me and Gabby, for butter, like two little girls in a fairy tale. She wanted to bring Leo, the dog she always had with her, but I wouldn't let her. They hated us enough already without our bringing a dog into the store. I remember the two of us walked like we were inside a ray of sunlight. She'd already become the favorite, not for being pretty though. A few months earlier, she'd figured out how to grow albaria. Others had tried it before and failed. They hadn't even managed to get the seeds to germinate. How could they have? They were just a bunch of kids who wanted to get high. But Gabby didn't give up. She'd been researching the flower since that one time we tried it. Frank, a guy named Tony, another one for the old guard. Gabby and I were the only ones Gutierrez chose for the session. It rained that day. No matter how hard I try, I know I'll never be able to fully put that trip into words. This wouldn't be my first attempt. The only thing that comes close is what I said before about the suppression of time and language. Yeah, that. I remember feeling like a viscous, simple universe all closed in on itself, like a wise, motionless snake. That's how I felt. Frank, Gabby, and all the bodies around me disappeared, transformed into sources of sounds and odors, sources of heat and worry more than anything. Yeah, a blind, absolute, paralyzing wisdom. That's how I describe Albaria. Gutierrez had questioned the locals, but no one in the islands had known or wanted to reveal the secrets of the seeds. He didn't care. He had a long list of substances he wanted to experiment with. After our session though, Gabby took over. It was strange to see her throw herself into a task. She abandoned her meditation technique and her followers. For a little while, she even acted like a healthy young woman. She'd disappear in the mornings, hitchhike to campus, and spend the day in the library. She also visited the nurseries in the area. That was around when she adopted the deer, a young buck, practically a fawn, that Clark had found starving to death by the side of the road. Um, its mother had been hit by a car. Gabby brought it home and it lived with us for a while like another resident. When it got too big, we built an enclosure in the garden. Gabby fed it every morning and spent hours on end brushing its coat. The whole thing always seemed to me like another one of her extravagances, another attempt by a desperate girl to assert her difference. But we, were talk but, <clears throat> uh, but we were talking about the day we went to town for butter. It was hot and neither of us was wearing a hat. I remember how the sun felt, like a halo, Gabby declared, and started in on one of her speeches about energy and breath. Like I said, she had a tendency to preach and her words made my hunger and my hangover worse. I felt like I was carrying the whole sun on my head. A 40 something year old woman with copper hair pulled her yellow car up to ask, a car up to us and asked if we needed a ride to town. 
Without consulting me, Gabby said yes, and I opened the, ba and opened the back door. I sat in the front. I heard her laugh and asked the woman to turn on the radio. The woman looked at her in the rear view mirror. There was tenderness in her eyes. When she turned to look at me, on the other hand, they went hard as coal. Gabby started filing a broken nail with the leather strap of her purse. There were no trees on that stretch of road and it was five or six degrees hotter in the car. The whole thing, us three in the yellow car, felt to me like a mirage wrapped in a bubble of heat. One of Bob Dylan's drowsier songs was playing on the radio, which made the sensation even more intense. I heard Gabby ask the woman if she had any nail polish. She looked startled. She said no, but if we went to a friend's apartment with her, she could get some for us and whatever else we wanted. She asked Gabby if she was hungry. Gabby said yes, that she'd been dying for a hamburger and a Coke. Then she added, it's your nails where you really see how the fetus is consuming you. I must need more calcium or iron, one of those things. I'm sure it's going to be a boy. They're more fragile than girls. They need more care. That was when I saw what the woman driving the yellow car saw. Not two girls walking into town wrapped in a sunbeam. She saw a brunette in jeans that were too tight for her and a top that announced she was in denial of not being a teenager anymore. And a skinny black girl with puffy eyes and a green gauze dress that just barely covered the bump of a baby she'd been carrying for months. I was obviously dragging Gabby along with me on the road to ruin rather than the nearest town. That's when she stopped, but that's why she'd stopped. That's why she, what she was trying to take us to her friend's apartment. Blessed to be the middle class, so easily scandalized with their yellow cars, their tooth whitening and their French manicures. Blessed be vacations paid in installments. Blessed be money well spent on Pyrex, Prozac and psychologists. I'm not sure if anyone at Bridgen knew. I think Gabby came up with this excursion because she wanted my complicity. She wanted to get rid of the baby. I hated her for that, for putting me above her in such an obvious way, like I was her mother, some spinster aunt. But she got it, my complicity, I mean, which isn't saying much. My tears, my words, my complicity, they aren't worth a thing. Make sure you write that down, doctor. It's not what a person, it's what a person does in the end that matters, what she does. Sure, Gabby could count on me, but not to get rid of the baby. Now that we had a real chance to prove that the community worked, that there was another way, that we didn't all need to fall for the biggest lie, I wasn't about to let some damn irresponsible girl ruin it. Because the next thing she did, right there in the car, was run through a list of all the substances she'd taken over the past few months. I saw the woman's hands tighten on the wheel. I saw her eyes, which had been hard as cold, burn with indignation. I saw her weighing her options and anticipating reactions. That woman didn't deserve the life running through her veins. Her skin was so white you could see her blood passing days through a body that had never shaken with pleasure or hit a high note off key, much less ridden life at a gallop. In the back seat, Gabby had begun to cry. She said that she was afraid the baby would be born a monster, that he'd be deformed, that all those drugs were bound to have consequences and for not knowing who the father was. Oh, sorry. And that maybe it was her punishment for not knowing who the father was that the baby was the child of all the men she'd slept with since, since arriving at Bridgend. I thought it was fantastic and couldn't believe that she couldn't understand what it meant. An entirely communal child, 100%. Imagine. I don't know which was worse, the woman driving with her arms stiff and her back too straight, or the girl soaked in tears and terrified of her own body. Fact, beauty never made anyone stronger. No matter how much of it Gabby had, she was always going to be that defenseless little animal in the back seat of a stranger's car. She was about two minutes away from asking the woman to adopt her. And the woman, please, she was practically calling her my child like those fake mothers in stories. The woman reached for the dashboard lighter. She'd stuck a cigarette between her lips. I watched her fix herself up as she talked. She was trying to buy time. She was probably trying to calculate Gabby's age. Yeah. She must have thought Gabby was a minor. She must have thought she could go to the police. I felt her thinking it with a clarity I haven't known in years. All I had to do was lift my left hand and hit her quick with the back of my fist. Yeah, this fist, just as effective back then as it is now. My knuckles got her right in the nose. The other hand went straight for the wheel. I think she in instinctively put her foot on the brake because the car came to a stop silently, majestically. The woman's face was covered in blood. 
The cigarette had fallen into her lap and had burned a hole in her salmon covered colored dress. Gabby had thrown herself on the floor and was screaming for me to stop, that it was bad karma, that I was crazy, stuff like that. I got out, opened the back door and dragged her out of the car. Then I went back, opened the white leather purse that had been on the dashboard the whole time, took all the money out and stuck it in my pocket with the car keys. The woman had her hands over her face and was crying, making a noise like she had the hiccups. I grabbed her by the hair and banged her head against the window a few times until she stopped. No one, I said to Gabby as she sat on the asphalt and cried, no one is going to come rescue you. Time to get cleaned up and buy some butter. <laughs> it's such a chilling scene and it moves in this just delirious way from one emotional state to another. Um, and um, I'm sure for those who you know, haven't had the pleasure of reading the full book, just hearing this, it's just really exhilarating to start a scene and it begins with a butter and it ends with a butter, but in the middle, there's just this whole wild ride that takes you in this, like, this full range of the emotional register. Um, and it was such a beautiful translation, Heather. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask about the scene and about the book in, you know, in its totality is that it came out in Argentina in 2016, before we sort of had the period of four years of delirium in this country from 2016 until 2020, when the book came out here in the United States. And I was just wondering about any shifting ideas you have, Bettina, as an author about American delirium in, the four, in the, these very vividly delirious four years that happened between your book coming out in Spanish and Argentina and then coming out here in English. And Heather, for you, translating it in this book that was writing about American delirium before, in these exact four years before it came out of, of the period that we were in in the US. And I know both of you were saying, of course, you as a translator, you were staying true to the book, but just having a sense of everything here feeling a little hallucinatory. And this book has hallucinogens throughout the book. Um, and so I was just wondering what, you know, what that meant for both of you, knowing the, you know, the book's first life in Spanish and, you know, writing about this country and about deliriousness and having it come out here in 2020. Well, I don't know if I can answer that, but um, it's always kind of weird to talk about the book you wrote so many years ago, right? But I feel um, very connected to this book, although I wrote it a long time ago. And I, one difference I notice now is uh, related to the audience, because we are seeing some little comments on the book, um, some little reviews or people that, you know, as yourself, Ida, that read it. Mm -hmm. And what surprised me is that um, American readers are uh, noticing more the utopian part of the book, mm. um, not the dystopian part of it. When this book came out in Spanish, uh, everybody said that it was almost post-apocalyptic or, or something like that. And I, I didn't feel the book had that tone. Mm. For me, it was more like, um, you know, effervescent and uh, full of energy and life. Um, so I'm kind of happy <laughs> with what I, what, with the things I'm hearing from American readers. And maybe how hungry people are for any little sliver of utopia we can get, you know, <laughs> there's a hunger for something utopic, you know, <laughs> any, any semblance or iteration of utopia, everyone is lining up. So I think that that also shows something about the needs, the emotional needs of readers, you know, and where they are. Mm -hmm. from when it came in. Heather, you're well, nodding. You, you felt that way as well? Um, a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm nodding to the sort of clinging to any shred of utopian hope. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly, certainly the case. Um, but I actually, I found that I, I, I didn't really sense a break between the, the world constructed in the novel and sort of a pre and post 2016, because I think um, what Bettina is so good at doing in this novel is showing the continuities of the sort of the, the tensions between different ideologies. I mean, even in this one scene, right, um, decades earlier, we see the tension between this sort of um, nuclear family, kind of white picket fence capitalist ideology 
um, and and the commune, and then this is it. It comes back up in the in the present of the novel, um, in this sort of rust belt um, disillusionment and and disenfranchisement, and people rejecting sort of society to go into the woods. And I and I thought that that was really masterful the way that 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 continuity is established as just a part of the logic of of not only the United States of America but also the way in which it becomes a reflection on America as a an entire uh, body of continents united um, and and so there I mean there is there is certainly a shift in our in our consciousness in 2016, but I think it's a, it's not a, it's not a, a radical switch. It's a, it's an exacerbation of underlying tensions and, and existing um, social problems. Yeah, I think I think you know it harkens back to these other eras, but I think everything feels heightened. One because there's hallucinogens that you know are floating throughout the book, but just like a heightened awareness of those tensions mm -hmm. and a heightened awareness of the outcomes and the consequences of those class tensions and those uh, you know those conflicting ideologies. But that's it's done in such a visceral, sensory way um, in the book and also in your mm -hmm. translation of it. You know, I mean, every scene has almost like a like almost like a hallucinogenic quality to it. And I wondered, you know, Bettina, how much that was something that you were thinking about while writing, how um, it's such a visual novel. And um, if you were sort of driven by certain images that you sort of sort of haunted you in, in the writing of it, you know, I, I wondered if that was something that stayed with you because you lived in the United States for, right. for many years. Right. Um I was 50% my own hallucination and 50% what I saw in the US, I think. Um, each scene is um, not, I mean, writing fiction is, it has a component that is um, where you have to plan a lot, but also you have to leave room for freedom, right? So I think once you get the voices in your head, and start writing, the scenes come to you naturally. So naturally in the atmosphere of, of this book, a lot of things uh, are related to the hallucination part of um, uh, the novel. So it's not only that there is a, a vegetable, a, a plant that is an, an hallucination causing substance, but also, you know, um, the dream, the idea of the dream is there, the idea of the American dream, the idea of dreaming uh, about the society that is not the society that we live in, a better society that could uh, transcend the family as an institution. So I was always fascinated by that, the historical part of that during the 60s and the 70s. So I think that uh, was the main component that you know, gave the novel the substance, the hallucinating substance, the idea of the 60s and the 70s. You know, I didn't get the chance to, to participate in that. So I guess I, I idealized that. And, you know, I, that's what, and, and became an obsession, you know, something has to become an obsession in order to write it. Yes, I think that's true. Something has to be an absolute obsession to carry your interest through the whole novel. If you, if you, you know, if you can, you know, loose it, loose its hold on you in some way, then you, it, you, you know, can't call, pull you through through the novel. I had one experience going to a commune once in Colorado. It was like the residues of it, and um, it was enough. Twenty four hours. I was like, okay, now I, I got a taste of that. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I love that it became, you know, it's, it, and, the, and there is that sort of sense of dreaming alongside the darkness of the novel. And I think that that's one of the beautiful tensions of the book. Um, and I, I wonder, this is the first time, Bettina, you've worked with a translation of your book into English, um, is with Heather, right? I work with other translation translators yeah. in the past, but with shorter texts from, from journals and other things. Yeah. So I wondered if you, the two of you could talk for a little, little bit, because I think that's always a really interesting thing to translate a writer who has lived in this country and speaks the language and the back and forth that that can allow. And in this case, I think what's particularly fascinating is that the book is also set, you know, in, in, in this country. So you're translating it back into the language in which 
the, the, the conversations occur. So you're sort of bringing it back, I would imagine in some way into the language in which Bettina, you were imagining the conversations in the novel. So I just, you know, just, you know, as a writer translator, I'm kind of curious how, how that happened. If maybe Heather, you were asking Bettina, like what words were you imagining, you know, in this exchange or how did, how did that happen? Heather? <laughs> Should I start? Um, yes, of course. So, so the, the, process of translating this novel was an absolute joy. Um, the conversations that Bettina and I had kind of over the course of, of a year, maybe, um, maybe a little bit less, were first kind of general sort of close reading, but general. The, the first things we started talking about were the three different voices. Um, so the, the first section of each chapter is a narrative centered on Vic, which is written in the third person, then Beryl is written in the first person. It's a monologue. She's recounting, as Bettina said, she's kind of telling her story to a camera. Um, and, and, and then the third section is also third person, but it has a slightly different tone from the first third person section. So kind of finding, finding the way to make those nuances work without pushing them beyond what Bettina had done, which is very subtle, the, the difference between Vic's and Berenice's narratives are, are subtle, but it's there. Um, so we started out with conversations like that. We didn't talk much about the dialogue um, because by the time uh, we, by the time I, I reached the, the point of, of really getting into edits and um, I was already, I had a version of each of these three people very clear in my head and having kind of laid the foundations with Bettina, she, she just said, go ahead and, you know, follow this you know, follow this so that it makes sense for you, right? So that the characters are, are cohesive and, and make sense to you. Um, and that's sort of how we worked. Um, and Bettina, what was striking to you while working um, on this and, and sort of reimagining, you know, these scenes as, 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 as you had translated them in your mind, you know, from English into Spanish back again? No, actually, it was more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, at a certain point, I was, I was in my, I think, my sixth year in the U.S. I was living in Pittsburgh, and I was writing, beginning to write this novel, and I realized that uh, sometimes I, I had a structure for a phrase in my head that belonged to the English language, not to the Spanish language oh, so instead of fighting that i just let it flow <laughs> right so this for me this book is right, written in a special kind of spanish that has english as a ghost structure behind it but also is written in many spanishes because by, by then I was, you know, surrounded by people who spoke Spanish, but not Argentine, Argentine Spanish, right? Different dialects from Mexico, from Peru, from Chile. So I start using words and structures and tones, especially tones, because mm. people think that language is related to the terms or the vocabulary, but it's not that what makes it takes alive is the tone, you know, the yeah. rhythm of the phrases. So I started to use words that didn't come from Argentine Spanish that belonged to different kind of Spanishes. So for me, it was, um, I was creating that special language for this book because it's a fictional city. It's written in Spanish. But the idea is to give you um, that atmosphere that you, you were talking about, the, the oniric, dreaming-like atmosphere. So language needed to collaborate with that. I couldn't, read, uh, I couldn't write this in my Rio de la Plata Spanish. It didn't make any sense. So as you can imagine, Idra, it's, that was a challenge for the translation. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> getting getting those layers, but but thinking about what what you were just saying, but you know one of one of the ways we approached that um, in the translation was that I suggested um, Vic comes from a, an invented island, 
uh, known as the Pompeii of the Caribbean um, that has gone through different uh, um, times of, of colonization. So Spanish colonization and then British. And so um, particularly with Vic's narrative, I inserted certain Britishisms because that would have been sort of the trace that could be the sort of texture of having different Spanishes. We, we had the sort of the colonial legacy um, of different Englishes. So I, I tried to work with that um, in, in his narrative to kind of mark that and... Um, yeah, I think the right tone and, and those shifts and the textures and the tone are, are there and it is why I think it's such a pleasure to read on the sentence level and also just like the use of repetition in that scene that you read with the blessed be the blessed be it almost has that sense of anaphora in a poem where mm -hmm. there's like every line begins with the same word and it, it almost creates a sense of um, you know, of hypnotizing you in a way of sort of like pulling you in and like a call and response sort of a way. And I think the novel keeps you engaged as a reader um, because you, every sentence has, has some surprise in it. I, I, it kept me very awake because it, it kept surprising, not just in terms of what happened in the scenes, but even as you're saying with the tone of the sentences and the shifts in um, diction that mm -hmm. occur, you know, with, within the same scene. Um, is there anything either of you would like to talk about we haven't hit on yet before we get to the questions? If anyone hasn't sent a question yet to the Q&A box, please um, put it there so we can get to your questions. And um, please support Politics and Prose and buy a copy of this brilliant novel. They um, are graciously hosting this launch in this long virtual era where we don't get to celebrate books in person quite yet. Um, um, but before we get to any questions, uh, Bettina or Heather, is there something else one of you would like to talk about we haven't hit on yet with the book? Hmm. hmm. I should have been, I should have been ready with something. No, no need. I have more questions. <laughs> I, I, one other thing I would love to ask about we're waiting for more questions in the box would be something about the impulse, Bettina, to create these um, unnamed places, which I think, you know, there's an unnamed city in the U.S. There's, you know, Vic comes from, you know, sort of a fabricated island that gives a sense of certain places. And um, I, I was curious about, you know, how that fits into sort of the utopia notions and the delirium of the novel. And it was just also more about giving you a little more imaginative room as an author, sort of what was your, what was, what was your reasoning for, for wanting to sort of not pinpoint exactly where? Well, I think both, right? Mm -hmm. We always like to have a lot of freedom as writers, but also it is difficult to work with a fictional city I mean, a fictional island, you know, <laughs> you have to be very careful with the places, the geographical details. Um, so I had to do a lot of research, especially, especially for that, for the island uh, and the Caribbean, because it's not a place I know a lot about. But um, also, you're right, it's related to the idea of uto utopia, right? I didn't want to name the city because I was already doing that, this, um, I did this in, in other books. You know, I was trying to depart from certain idea of realism, realistic fiction as, you know, the main discourse or the main genre um, to understand reality. I think sometimes to understand reality, you need uh, to leave realism on the side and do something different. You have to look at, at reality, you have to look at the facts or the things you want to talk about through like looking through a glass, right? Looking to some kind of filter. I like um, uh, an essay by Flannery O'Connor that says that in order to um, tell an emotional truth about something, you need to distort it in fiction. If you just write it the way it happened, it won't convey that emotional force. So I was trying to do something like that. I think you, I think you pulled it off. I also um, think you. that you know, realism is only there as something to subvert at this point. You right. know, <laughs> you have to sort of 
take a risk or take a seat. And um, you certainly <laughs> nice. took a risk this one. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really, I really admired how many things you are willing to distort in order to see reality with, mm. you know, that new, that new glass that, that, you know, the clarity that comes from sort of looking away and looking back in some sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. I did actually think of something um, as we, as we collect more questions. Um, we had a very interesting exchange recently over email. I can't remember how we started Bettina, but it, we, we were talking a little bit about the three voices and kind of getting to know the characters. And I said, you know, at first I, I just jumped right in with Beryl. I loved her voice and I had such a, just such a blast translating her. And then Bernice is a beautiful story and feels kind of a little bit magical. There's this sort of like dark fairy tale quality to it, which was difficult, but, but enjoyable. And then Vic was the hardest one for me because he's kind of an asshole. And, <laughs> and it was hard for me to, um, to really get inside his head because, in, because the way that you write him, he's as resistant on the page as he seems to be in real life. And, and it's mm -hmm. amazing the way that you, you managed to do that. Um, and then you said in, in your response, yeah, I had the hardest time with Vic too. Like I wanted him to be, I wanted him to be better, but he just, <laughs> he just made some bad choices. Right. <laughs> so, would you, would you talk a little bit about um, kind of the way that you found your relationship to these characters developing and how, how they, because you, you talk about freedom in writing and writing and just how that kind of took shape over the years. Wow. Um, I wanted to like Vic. Actually, I, I like him a lot, but he has a lot from myself, right? So the, the part that of myself that it has that I don't like very much is the idea of um, and not uh, being vulnerable. You know, it's a person that is sick. He has a terminal disease and he is mad. He's angry at the world. Right, and that I can understand that vulnerability, and that was my connection with him. So that's how the novel began from me, because he found he finds a woman living in his closet, and he feels threatened by it. He doesn't feel the need to help that woman. He is an immigrant. He has a terminal disease. He is in a very weak position. So I had, I tried to understand that. I tried to put myself in his shoes and he surprises me in, along the way because he made some, you know, unethical choices, things that I, I, I probably won't, won't do, but they made sense for, for him. They, they made him, they made sense. And, so, and I learned a lot by writing that you know you have to detach yourself from the characters um, the characters may have something from you but they are not you and you know what you need to go with what uh, works for them and for the story you want to tell and so she, he's not a typical immigrant i wanted to you also work with that you know because he feels superior to that society and he's not there because he likes the country. He's there because he had no other option, right? So I wanted to stress that. And so with all, all those feelings, uh, his actions made a lot of sense, right? That's a fascinating answer, Bettina. Um, I am going to give you a couple questions from um, listeners. Um, first one, are there plans um, for this novel to come out in other languages um, that, you, that, that you know of so far? I know. Last week I had um, an email from my agent telling me that um, she's about to close a deal with a Turkish language. Fascinating. Oh, she had that's that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So that's that's 
often. <laughs> That's what I know. <laughs> um, and connected to that, um, how about an audio book? And um, one listener, Carlos, is wondering if Heather, maybe you could read the audio book. <laughs> you you read with such a <laughs> She's such a good Would reader to, also. But there is an audio book. Um, mm-hmm. So there is, um, yes, it is. I think it's even available when the book comes out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, they'll be released simultaneously, I think. So, and maybe um, my, my future career as an audiobook reader you know, is still in the works. It's not <laughs> well, I think when you translate, you know, you, you could hear when you were reading where you were putting the emphasis in the sentence in English and staying attuned to those shifts in register and tone. And, you know, so, you know, it's just hearing your voice, you could hear, um, you know, the, the places where you wanted to sort of really make the sentence sort of come alive with more emphasis. So I, you know, I, maybe that could be a whole movement of translators reading books because they've lived with those sentences in such a deep way. Well, I think cool. so. I mean, it's it's interesting because, you know, the translation, as, as we know, is an act of interpretation and so is reading for an audiobook. So, and on one hand, it's very interesting to have someone else interpreting your interpretation of Bettina's work, right? It's it's three levels, which can, can add a level of interest, but I think it'd be very cool for, for more translators to read um, their, their, their renderings. I wonder why I had such a hard time listening to audiobooks of my own novels as a translator, because it is an act of interpretation. I never really thought of that way. And I was like, oh, this 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 audio actor, because many of them are professional actors, was was interpreting a character's tone in a way that sounded so different from what I heard in my head. And it was almost like hearing somebody do a, a translation. It was an interpretation mm-hmm. that sort of sounded entirely different than I had imagined the character's voice. So I, I think as translators, you know, it is it is very similar act, although one is oral and one is written. Mm-hmm. But in many ways, there's 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 a parallel there for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope someone will write an essay on that. I would love to read that. Um, in the meantime, we have a great question here. Um, Bettina, what inspired you to use a hallucinogen as a plot device? And were you using it as a symbol for natural behaviors? that you've observed, sort of what was the origin of that as a sort of correlative for human behavior? I have to think about that when, mm-hmm. well, I had the crazy beer from the very beginning and I had the hippie commune. Mm-hmm. So, and I had a, a woman who owns a shop, a plant, you know, shop. So it all added to some kind of special um, plant and um, I actually wrote a short story before this this novel that had an hallucination and was it was not a plant it was something that actually existed and um, it's related and I think it, it's, it was kind of popular at some time in the US it's a, it's, it was a toad leaking I um, sect or group of people, so people who licked at toads, right? That that was kind of weird for me. It's a toad that lives in the desert, I think in New Mexico or California. Um, but the name of that toad uh, inspired the name of the plant and the idea of people, you know, almost making a cult around uh, an hallucinational uh, is in the culture, right? From the Christians to the Greeks to the Romans, you know, in almost every religion had at a certain point uh, a mystical or, or, you know, help from some substance. So um, I wanted to play with that. Oh, that's fascinating. It's interesting. I, I wonder what cults will come of this pandemic. What are people licking <laughs> off their Zooms that we don't know about? Toads, who knows what cult will come? I was just speaking with a friend recently who was like, what do you think happened? Well, all these people just, what behaviors will come of this? I sort of feel like this American delirium as a novel sort of in some ways might sort of give us a little taste of what cults may come of licking animals in the desert once everyone leaves their house again and takes off their masks. Who knows what will come? Um, I think that was one of the pleasures of this book that it sort of got my mind going to places I wouldn't have otherwise. And I think that's always a sign of a great book when it sort of gets your your mind sort of shooting off in, in a place that you wouldn't have gone without having read that line or that, that scene in the book in some way. 
Um, hold on. Let's maybe we have time for one last question. Um, somebody is asking, how did the responses to this novel differ between your North and South American readers? I mean, I guess for, it's a little hard to say that so far for the, the translation here because it officially comes out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we have some advanced copies yeah. sent to people. So we know, you know, we had some feedback from them and from them. I know I got this beautiful back cover with a lot of quotes <laughs> that were very, you know, um, brilliant and beautiful read readings of the novel. And they all emphasize the idea of utopia and the idea of, um, you know, uh, the, criti the critical uh, approach to reality, the idea of um, writing novel that, all, that is pure fiction, but also it's a uh, commentary on our present and the way we are living in the world. So I'm, I'm very happy with this. And it was very different in Argentina. I got very good read readings also, but different. They were very different. Yeah, and, and, and I think also, well, it'll be interesting to see how people read this. Um, you know, in another era too, and sort of thinking about, you know, the, the hunger we talked about earlier for some sort of tiny slice of utopia, however we can get it, you know, deep into the second pandemic winter. I think that, you know, it's great reading for, for the time we're in, just reading about like a halo of sunshine since I'm here on um, the East Coast with lots of snow. That alone was Pure delight. Um, we are closing in on the last couple minutes. Um, if anyone has a last question, Julia, you're back on if you want to take over. Hi. Um, we do have a bonus question we like to ask of our esteemed panels here at Politics and Prose. So after readers hurry to grab their copy of American Delirium tomorrow, um, are there other books that you're reading or would like to suggest individually that are helping you through this pandemic? Well, um, I was a little bit late to the party, but I did recently read Severance. Um, Me too, just like two weeks ago. <laughs> it's so good. Um, are you looking for it on your shelf? Adrian? Yeah, I have it too. I was like, oh, <laughs> funny, we were just reading it. I was just looking, yeah. I was like, it's here, it's here. I just had it out the other day. <laughs> that would be my recommendation. I absolutely, it was, it, and yeah. Instead of kind of going to a utopian uh, alternative universe, I found it comforting to kind of the, the sort of mirroring that happens in the experience I felt accompanied in pandemic. Bettina, how about you? I will go with A Love in Infant Monkeys by Lydia Miller. Um, that book, um, I know, that to me, I love animals and the idea of she writing a book about how we deal with animals, these different short stories um, where you can see famous people as characters like Madonna and Noam Chomsky. I mean, it's, it's an amazing book to think, to rethink um, the, our place in the world related to the animals. Um, I was reading Christina Steed's um, The Little Hotel. She's an Australian author. Um, I'm going to be leading, uh, hosting for a public space, a book, they have a, a public space together readings and, and that's going to be an upcoming book. I'm, so I'm hosting it. So I've been reading that very carefully. And it's, it's amazing to think all these people eating and talking together and in a hotel, because that feels so far away from where we are and everyone's sort of eating and clinking their spoons and looking at each other's tables. And it feels so audacious um, to be eating in the same room that way. So um, that's kind of, it feels very much like um, another era just to have all these people, you know, living together in a space with strangers that way. So um, that's been delightful to think of that happening again. Um, it's been delightful to do this event with all of you and thank you everyone who came to the event tonight. And thank you, Julia, for having us. Yes, thank you all. Many thanks again to Bettina Gonzalez, Heather Cleary, Idra Novi, and our audience out there tuning in. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you these kinds of amazing live events. We wouldn't be able to do them without the book sales to support them. So make sure you follow the link in the chat to grab your copy of American Delirium, or you can visit politics-prose.com um, to grab that book as well as 
Idrinovi's Those Who Knew, and other books translated by Heather. Um, while you're there, make sure you check out our events calendar for all the latest and greatest from us and from our shelves to yours. We hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and staying well-read. We will see you next time. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you. Guys.